I know you have explained it many times, but you know, can you please explain how the loading, unloading, and bypassing happens in a screw compressor? For compressor, there's two styles out there. All right, so we have a slide valve. So we have a slide, and then we have a variable speed. I did pass third grade, but not much past that. Okay, so if that's not spelled right, I'm sorry. So we have a slide and we have a variable speed. Um, variable speeds are fairly simple machines. Just if that's all they are, okay? That means that if you're a true variable speed, and what we're talking about when we say this, we're talking about a York um, YCIV, YVAA styles of compressors. They do not have a slide in them. They quite literally just speed up and slow down. Now they run at a higher hertz uh, rate. So where your standard motor is a 60 hertz motor or 50 hertz if, if you're outside of the U.S., uh, these will be up to 200 hertz. They do not follow the same frequency that the a regular compressor would. And when I talk about slide valve, if you're not if you haven't actually seen one of these, I happen to have one. This is what I'm talking about. Okay, so this is our actual slide. This is the shaft, and this is our piston. This is our puck. This is our uh, slide ring. I, there's various terms for it, but the way these work right here is where your male and female rotors would sit. Okay. So this part of it is actually be creating a sealing surface for the screws to seal up against. And as this moves, cause this is what moves, not your screw bolts, but the actual, um, slide here. As this moves, we're adjusting the capacity by how much these screws are actually able to compress. To summarize the variable speed, there's nothing mechanically going on here other than we haven't hit chill water set point, so we need to increase compressor speed to get to chill water set point, leaving water set point. That's all it is. When we overshoot leaving water set point, we slow down and we get to that. Very, very simple. What's less simple is when we have a slide valve. So these are typically uh, oil controlled. Here is an example of a handbell compressor. This is the slide. Now the slide I have is actually out of a train. I want you to see just the, how similar they are. All right, so this is a train slide. And then this is a handbell slide. There's not a whole lot of difference between them, is there? And that's intentional because this is fundamental engineering way to go about it. This is just how the technology works. From company to company, there may be slight differences. I'm not saying you can take this out of this compressor and go put it in a train and vice versa. That's not going to work. But the fundamental of how this technology works is still the same. So what you're seeing right here is this compressor is mostly loaded is mostly loaded. The whole underbelly of this compressor is exposed. There is no sealing surface down there. It is just up here where this slide is. And you'll see these oil ports, all these yellow marks, these are oil ports. Now these ports down here are feeding our bearings. Uh, and this bearing, uh, these bearing chambers or assemblies are uh, in the low pressure side of the system. We use uh, deferential pressure, high pressure oil, to feed into our low pressure side. So I just want you to understand what these are. But then up here, these are to our actual slide chamber. So where the puck is up here. We fill this side of the chamber right here with oil in order to push against this spring and slide this slide where we need it. And then the spring, as we relieve the oil back out of here, the spring will force the slide back over. And as that slide moves, so as that if as the slide is fully to the right in this example, that would be a fully loaded compressor. We are moving maximum uh, CFM of refrigerant through this compressor at that point. As the slide is furthest to the left, it is the minimum loaded it can be. We're moving the least amount of, refri of refrigerant through this compressor at that point. Uh, and I do see there is some confusion about this. You know, some people have an understanding that 
we cover the compressor up to reduce compression and uncover it to increase compression. That is not, that's not the case. It's actually the other way around. We cover to create a, a sealed zone for compression. Okay, so this whole little zone in here becomes the compression side because all this under here, this is your suction pulling into the screw bolts from the bottom side. And then you have, um, then you, they compress through this chamber here and then push out into our discharge and then out into the oil separator for this particular compressor. There's a couple of different ways that these oil ports get ran. That's less important. Some of them will use a load and unload solenoid where we're just, we push more oil in to load it. We pull oil out to unload it. And then the slide just responds accordingly. Others, um, we will we'll have like st uh, stage or staggered solenoids. So there'll be one solenoid for 25%, one solenoid for uh, 50%, one solenoid for 75 and one for 100% capacity. And then we'll have just the, the unload solenoid from there. So as those solenoids engage and work, uh, it'll step up and stagger the compressor staging based off of that solenoid that we trigger or fire. So that kind of depends on just the compressor, manufacturer. Handbells can do it both ways, just depending on which model you go with. A lot of manufacturers use a load-unload, like Train as an example, use a load and unload solenoid. So there's just two total. I would say that's probably the more common way I've see that I see this done. Not all of them have a spring in here, only some of them. Obviously, this handbell does. Uh, the ones that don't have a spring, as the we're relieving oil, uh, the system pressures will draw that, that piston back into an unloaded state. But a spring is fairly, it, I, especially on larger compressors, I, I would say a spring is a lot more normal, or at least I see springs used more. Uh, it just ensures that this piston actually moves properly. Now, that's just from a slide perspective, okay? We can take this a step further with modern machines, and now we're de dealing with a variable speed and slide. So we have a combination compressors out there now. The Dunham Bush AVX is an example of this. It is a vertical screw with a slide and variable speed combination on the compressor. So obviously with variable speed, we're gonna to wanna to start off on our minimum Hertz. That is the standard. We're used to that in every motor application we have. Same thing with our slide. We want this slide in a fully unloaded position when this compressor goes to turn on. That is the, the proper state and then we will load it up from there. Now when we see these get used in combination, what you will see is these slides are the first loading mechanism. So the variable speed motor will come online at a minimum hertz, whatever that set point is for that particular motor, which even, even from chiller to chiller, it may be the same model, but depending on the conditions, I've seen that change. This chiller at this site, you know, with this model needs X minimum hertz, but this other chiller due to these reasons needs a slightly higher minimum hertz. Either way, uh, this, this motor will start off at a minimum state and the slide will start off at a fully unloaded state. So in this case, it'd be slid all the way to the left. Before we start increasing speed on the motor, we will push the slide to a fully loaded position. So when you have a combination between these two, just understand this is the process. Uh, and this is, this is how I've seen it done across the board. This isn't specific to a, partic a particular manufacturer but we're gonna push that slide to a fully loaded state first. Then once the slide is at fully loaded, we will start to increase our motor speed. And essentially this just becomes another way of reducing capacity on the motor and on the compressor because on their own, they can only unload to a certain point, but put in combination together, they can unload even further. I'm just pausing there to kind of let that sink in for a minute. Just a quick recap. When you have a combination of variable speed and slide, slide is your first stage of loading. Variable speed is your second stage. Same thing is true on the unloading cycle. We will unload to a minimum hertz. When we hit that point, we will then unload the slide uh, for the rest of it. 
And to get into your bypass portion of the question of, okay, what about when we're bypassing? So bypassing is you're going to be referring to a hot gas bypass. The only compressor I know of that does it internally is the train compressors they use on the RTAAs, the what CHHBs, where this I think the smaller ones or that may have been the larger. Either way, the the train had a set, but for the most part, majority of them are going to be just a standard external hot gas bypass. They're not going to be internal. Uh, to the compressor. So if we have our compressor here and then let's bring our suction line in. Okay, let's go into the evaporator. We have our discharge going out. What we'll have in the middle is our hot gas bypass connection. Now these can be controlled by a solenoid valve. Um, these will these can be controlled by a pressure regulator like a, a head pressure control something along those lines if there is a pressure regulator you'll have both a solenoid and a regulator so essentially the the regulator just helps meter the flow where the solenoid is actually controlling when the flow is happening but there are some cases where there's not a regulator you just have a smaller size uh, bypass assembly it's not like a, a large pipe, if you will. So that way they know that, okay, once they open it, this constant flow here is sufficient because of when they know it's going to be engaging. So hot gas bypass is just another form of unloading. It's putting a false load on our suction side and just recirculating that compressor without processing it through the condenser. So we're just reprocessing that heat, but it keeps our evaporator pressures up and we need it to be. This is a way of trying to keep the compressor online. And this comes back to a core concept that we have with, with uh, chillers and compressors. We don't want to cycle off unless we actually intentionally chose to, right? So a, a off cycle at night, as an example, that's an intentional decision. What we don't want to have happen is during the during the occupied time when we want this equipment online, we don't want compressors having to turn off and on. That's a bad thing. That's a lot of efficiency loss. That's a lot of mechanical wear. So if we have conditions where we have load swings, where in some we have extremely minimal loads, but we still want to keep those compressors online, we can utilize a hot gas bypass to maintain suction pressure and keep the compressor functioning without having to completely shut down. But then once we get to once we start having it load back up, this should disengage again. And this typically there's there's different trigger points I've seen different companies use for when they bring on hot gas bypass. It could be uh, evaporator saturation temperature. It could be once the compressor hits you know underneath a certain RLA current percentage. There's different values. That'll come back to the actual chiller you're looking at and what they're using to control when this turns off and on. But that is its purpose and function. And it, it almost all of them are going to be external. And you see these on centrifugals and stuff too with water-cooled equipment. Those will actually have like a butterfly valve instead of a ball valve. That's just due to scale and size. But that butterfly valve will open and close to modulate flow on, on an equipment at that scale. In my uh, chiller certification course, like I go deep dive into this entire thing and I show you more examples and I drill into this and it gives you an opportunity to get in there and engage and ask more questions if you'd like. So um, I would recommend that if you're not, go enroll in the certification course at chilleracademy.com and there's a whole module in there just on screw compressors and you'll be able to review that module and see uh, I go over their staging I go over their design like the internal design and how that works the oil cycle like I cover everything you would need to know on what makes a screw compressor function and how they how you should expect them to work from a fundamental scale and it's something you can work through at your own pace it's a self-paced program so I would I'd highly recommend 